I said, I'd like to go ahead and get started. As we have folks join, David, if you would let them in, I'd appreciate it. But welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. We've got another great program from Ron Bunce. Before we get started, I do have a few announcements. So I think I, everyone may have seen the email I sent out regarding the woodworking or the wood sale, woodworking sale of uh, the late Wilfred Allen. I don't believe he was a member, but he certainly was an accomplished woodworker. And his daughter had been referred to us, uh, referred to me, because she has all of his stuff that she's trying to uh, dispose of with care. And her biggest want is to not have all of his wood and stuff end up in somebody's fireplace. So that's why I sent the meeting out or the, the message out. And I saw some of you there today. It certainly is a lot of stuff. Um, and you do have to be careful going through everything, but you know, I think it's it's probably worth a trip, especially if you know what you're looking for, which I don't. But it was still it was still interesting to just see his accumulation from all those years. So there's uh, tomorrow and what is today? Thursday, Friday and Saturday, I guess, from um, 10 to five. And then they're coming back in June uh, after the holiday for, I guess, getting rid as much as she can. I did ask her what she was gonna do with all that material if it didn't get sold. And, you know, so I said, we would be more than happy to take some of it and use it for our community projects. So they may or may not contact me, but if they do, I, I'm going to hopefully need some folks who know what they're looking at and what we might be able to use for our community and, and, and projects. So something to think about. All right. Next thing I want to mention is, uh, yes, we are having our first in-person meeting next month. So we're excited about that. It will be June, what, 17th. And as promised, I will have cake and ice cream for everyone. Uh, I'd like to have it before the meeting starts. If you recall, no, that's not true. Anyway, we're gonna have it before so the ice cream doesn't melt in case the program runs long. And if anyone wants coffee, you better come early and make it because you don't want my coffee. If you remember, it could probably be used as paint thinner. So there's that. Then June 12th, look, June 12th, we've got the swap meet out at Faust Park. And that should be fun. Everybody's responsible for bringing your own setup, your own tables, having your own financial transaction, doing your own financial transaction. The guild will not be assisting in that way. The guild will have some of their own items that we're, we're looking to sell. No swapping, we just wanna sell. Um, so after that, we will be offering lunch to all those that participate about, I think 11 o'clock Wayne, if, if that's what I recall in the newsletter. And then another thing I wanted to mention is um, I had a message from Chris, I think it's Linen Broker, who is the new lumber manager out at Rockler in Bridgeton. And apparently they've doubled their size of um, lumber footprint and they've added cutting and planing services and he's anxious for us to get the world word out. So as you know, Rockler, Rockler is a tremendous corporate sponsor for us and I told him I'd be happy to make this announcement. I think everybody on their mailing list probably got their flyer about this same uh, service and um, item. So there's that. One more thing. <clears throat> I hope you had a chance to read the newsletter and read my president's letter. I am very serious about trying to diversify the organization. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean male, female, but I'm, I'm also hoping that we can get some younger people in there. And as our members have their skill sets, I'd love to get more mentor and mentee relationships going because it's, uh, you know, as we talked, it's a very tactile, um, hobby 
And it's so enjoyable and so refreshing to do that I wish I could do it better, but I would love to get um, more younger people involved in, in the craft. So to that point, one of the things we're trying to do is ask members to update their profiles on the web page. Uh, it's quick, it's easy, just some drop downs we've added to get uh, a little more information about you so we can work on the mentor mentoring program and tailor more of our classes for the skill level of our members. So that's what I know about that. Any questions on any of those? Yes, Alan, you asked about pie. I'm going to see if I can get John to make a couple of key lime pies. Will that work? I hope so. Okay. Um, any other questions? We'll move on. All right. I have a couple of community outreach updates for you. On behalf of Tom Tierney, he wanted me to share that the Guild has delivered 20 desks in May. And they didn't sit around long because they got distributed to kids at Northside Community School very quickly. And they went to second and third graders and it was based on need. So there is another build Tuesday, the 25th. All the slots have been filled, but Tom expects to have at least two events uh, each month going forward. So I would just remind everyone that working on these Group projects at the shop is a great way to start learning the craft if you're new and helping zip through and make a lot more desks if at all possible. All right, Tom also asked me to mention that uh, on the make a box, what is it? Bring BMA, I don't know, the, the, book, the book box thing that we do. Um, again, April was busy and the uh, boxes are going out. They expect things to pick up in the coming months. So our inventory to them has been drastically reduced and we do expect to be uh, getting kits out again very shortly. So those of you that were interested in the, the, the bring me, somebody tell me, bring me boxes, no, books, boxes. Anyway, you know what I mean. So thank you for that. Then, uh, okay, uh oh, the toy report. I'll do that and then Wayne, I'll turn it over to you. So uh, there will be a toy pickup June 8th at Faust Park at the shop from nine to 10. And we will also begin collecting toys at our meeting. So if you miss the June 8th pickup, be sure and bring them uh, at our, to our meeting. But in May, we collected 460 toys, bringing us year to date. It's just a little over 2,600. We delivered uh, only 65 in May because we still have been asked by our recipients to just kind of cut back. But year to date, that's putting us at 1620. And since 1994, almost 77,000 toys being delivered to our recipient organizations. We have um, Bill Muth exceeded the uh, 700 club and he's at 710. Two of our members have exceeded the 500 club and that's Wayne Humphrey and Linda Turner. Then we also have a uh, 400 club exceeder and that's Rich Sanders. And we have one new first time contributor, Paul Bailey. So thank you everyone for all you're doing to keep that program going. We know it's gonna pick up and then I'm going to ask Wayne to speak just uh, for a minute about the, the Toys for Tots and the Lifewise Bigger Toy program that we uh, are working on next. <clears throat> With the drop off of the demand uh, from our regular recipients of toys, you know, we'd like to continue to push this program forward, not lose momentum, get new people involved. And we do have a need for toys come Christmas time, Toys for Tots and the other organization that's uh, helping out underserved, uh, impoverished people in the St. Louis area. And they would like as many as 600 toys. They've got quite a clientele and a lot of kids in some of these families. So we're gonna try to build some bigger toys for Christmas. 
Toys for Tots, Bigger Toys, and the other organization. And I think what we're going to do is uh, try to start working a program out in the shop where every week or two weeks we get a group of people together and build some of these things. And uh, we'll have to pick out what we want to build and uh, how we're going to get them finished and all of that type of thing. Because we've got to do it on days the shop's available and we don't have a lot of storage room out there. But uh, I'm looking at an airplane plan that I've um, built about a dozen large airplanes with, uh, made out of two by fours, quarter inch Baltic birch. And the, uh, they, they go together relatively easy. If they're a seaplane, they look a little bit different than a typical airplane and uh, twin or three engines on them, depending on how you want to build them. There's lots of variations that you can build. That would be one of the things. And then we also, I have a plan for a rocking horse for a toddler. And I think maybe uh, Bill Shukat's built one of these in the past, but I've got plans for those and they're made out of two buys. And uh, then they uh, have color prints, which you glue onto the, uh, the horse and then cover up with um, sealing agents, whatever finish you want to use. And I think those would be a, a, a great item that we could build out in the shop uh, using band saws, uh, routers, sanders, that type of thing. And uh, be a good one for anybody who uh, doesn't feel their skill levels as high as what they would like it to be. It'd be a good practice item on them. So uh, what we're gonna do is make a proposal to the board uh, next month, uh, look for some money and uh, see if we can get this program rolling we do get it rolling. Uh, we'll have to figure out a schedule when we can work out at the shop and we'll do a sign up for those just like we do for classes or anything else. And um, we do have, uh, we're, look, we're going to be looking for people that will finish these. Uh, the airplanes need some, if not all of the parts painted before they are assembled. And the, uh, the rocking horse, uh, once the parts are cut out and uh, sanded, uh, they need to have the artwork put on them before they are finished. So uh, we're looking for all kinds of different people to do all kinds of different things on these. So keep an eye on your emails and the newsletter. We'll fill you in as uh, this program gets rolling. Thanks, Wayne. And if anybody has any other ideas for some of those bigger toys, you know, let's elevate those ideas because uh, the better, the more variety we have, the better. Okay, I think that's all the announcements I have. So Bill Shukat, would you like to introduce our guest speaker tonight for our program? Oh, I'd be happy to. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Ron Bonds. Uh, Ron makes dovetail saws, carcass saws, and resin infused mallets uh, in his shop in Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, if you don't know about Ron, he makes beautiful saws uh, with an art decor flavor to them. The first thing you notice about one of Ron's saws um, is that they are works of art themselves. Uh, mother of Pearl met, uh, medallions uh, rimmed in brass. His brass backs are elegantly engraved. The handles are meticulously shaped in highly figured woods. At first glance, you may consider framing the saw and putting it on the wall. That being said, I am pleased to turn the presentation over to Ron and he'll give us some insight into how he does all this. Well, hi, I don't know if they're that great or not, but it's saw. Um, I wanted to uh, go over just some of the saws, uh, some of the saws that I make obviously uh, our Western saws, of course. Um, I won't talk about Japanese saws too much. Um, obviously, there are many types of saws. We're looking at cross-cut logging saws, you know, one-man, two-man saws, which are, can be quite large uh, from days gone by. Uh, everything is covered by power tools these days. The uh, Using hand saws, dovetail saws, different types have really come back into uh, focus in the last probably 20 years as people started getting back to the, the, the higher end crafts. Uh, and this is a very tactful uh, feel. Uh, I've been woodworking about 40 years and butchering wood for <laughs> that long. But uh, I, I got into uh, making saws basically because of the fact that uh, I wanted to cut hand, 
hand, uh, hand cut dovetails. And uh, I didn't have a saw. Obviously, I tried everybody else's uh, pretty much and couldn't really find something that I liked. And of course, I was still am pretty much a novice at cutting dovetails by hand. Uh, but I learned a little bit along the way and started making my own saws. And, and one thing went to another. And the next thing I knew, I was making custom saws for people. Um, like I said, there's a lot of different types of Western saws. So I'm going to focus on those, the type of saws that you and I would normally make uh, for woodworking or use for woodworking, whether it's cutting dovetails or cutting tenons by hand, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of tasks that we use hand saws for, you know, ripping boards, as some people are called Neanderthals, really, because they use strictly hand saws. There's obviously, I, I think that uh, anybody who really wants to get into woodworking, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of money, uh, to, to invest in power tools and so forth, um, you should start out with hand tools. You learn more about woodworking and the craft using hand tools than ever will you know, using a, a power saw or butchering saw, as I sometimes refer to them as. Okay, but, but uh, just to give you an idea of the, the range of Western saws, I'll start out with back saws first and then I'll move on to hand saws. But uh, for example, this is, I don't know if you can see this, this is about the smallest. Uh, Gen saw that I'll make, and I actually made this just for working on other saws, actually just to help me get into it. The teeth on this are about 20, 20 PPI or 19 teeth per inch, uh, which is the way you to say it. And that's about as fine a tooth as I can file. And to give you an idea of the size of the file that it requires, uh, about this big, and it's a, a relatively small, it's a four double X. And I even use needle files from time to time. And I'll compare the different files here in a little bit and get an idea. But from here, it's like, so this is 20 P PPI. I might go up to a standard size gent saw, which is a, a 10 inch gent saw. Now this one also is 20 P uh, PPI. I have my, my personal, these are my personal saws, by the way, but I have uh, saws that go up, they go from 20 uh, PPI gent saws in particular down to 15. PPI, and it just depends on some days I, I'm more comfortable with this kind of a saw. Uh, other days I'm more comfortable with a pistol grip type of saw, which you're probably more apt to see. Uh, these saws you can buy, you know, less expensive gent saw for $25, you know, a crown tool saw or so forth. So you get, it gets you into woodworking fairly inexpensively. Uh, of course, the downside is, of course, learning to file saws. Um, next, thing, next thing up is going to be a now you're looking at a pistol grip saw. Now the thing about this saw is it has a higher hang angle, which is the angle the saw makes. If you were to, I can't, I can do this. You were to draw a straight line through here and then at 90 degrees to it, go ahead and where it intersects the saw teeth, that would give you your hang angle. This is a fairly high hang angle. So if you're standing over something or by, it's a little easier to use. If you're cutting, uh, for instance, half line dovetails, when you have to cut upward, and it create, makes it a little easier to use, uh, cut those dovetails. Um, again, this is only about a 16 a PPI saw. And now, when you, once you, they come in all sorts of shapes as well and, and designs, of course. Now, this is, uh, this is more of a traditional looking saw, uh, other than being ebony, you don't need this saw, but you notice it's, it's square on both ends. And that's really a traditional look to any, any saw. Um, it really depends on how much fluff you want to put into the saw. Obviously, I used ebony and uh, mother of pearl inserts on this one. Again, it's my saw. Yeah. Uh, this, this one, for example, is 15 PPI. So it's a little more coarse of a cut. But for a dovetail saw, it's just fine. Now, dovetail saws range from about 14 PPI to, up to about, uh, well, I have one that's 18. And, of course, my gent saws go to 20. And when we were talking about fluff, I mean, some people just like a little bit of fluff. They like to have it something distinctive. This is probably one of my latest ones. Um, I haven't even finished it yet, but you can see all the, the end, the, the, all the, the the loops I'm putting into the handle and so forth. And this one, in fact, is it has a 32 degree hang, which is much more uh, low compared to, I don't know if that's correct to say that, lower. Um, but and this makes it easier if you're cutting on a, using a mock saw vise. I don't know if anybody, anybody knows what mock saw vise is. It tends to raise the woodwork on your bench a little bit. So when you're cutting, it's a little more, keeps your wrist in a little more natural position, a little more comfortable. And this one, of course, I think I, I punched this one out at uh, 16 PPI. So just a, just a standard. I, I tend to like the 
15 to 16 ppi range for my western dovetails and of course you can even go further in, into it of course and, and you start to get into resin fused handles uh, which is quite costly and it's a frankly it's a little bit of a pain to do actually I have to uh, infuse all these hand handles and rough, and then I have to uh, shape everything. But then you get into more money. A lot of people don't care for that. If you just want a utilitarian saw, then something with a square plate, um, you can find or a Vinci saw. I would recommend anybody starting out with a Vinci saw to begin with. Um, I never recommend people, and, and we, we're all guilty of this. We see this nice saw and want to pay you know, three, four hundred dollars for this saw. But we don't know how to sharpen the saw. We don't know how to take care of the saw. And a lot of times we don't know how to use it. So you're kind of wasting, throwing money without the experience. You have to have that experience to back it up. But once we go out of dovetail saws, then you're going to move up to something like a carcass saw. Now, this is a 12 inch carcass saw, more or less. Uh, you can call them a 12 inch sash if you want. It just depends on how it's filed. And uh, that's one thing that all these saws have in common is they're all filed for a certain task. Um, this is obviously got a shaped plate and so forth. It doesn't, you can have a, you can have it squared off if you want. It's, it doesn't really matter whatever woods you use and handle wise. I, I tend to like closed loop uh, handles only because I think they're stronger. But this saw would normally be by a cross cut. It wouldn't be by a rip like a dovetail saw. And that's because it's going, you're doing a lot of cross cutting with it on, on your wood. And it gives you a smoother cut there. Uh, once you're going from the carcass saw, next you're going to move up to uh, basically what amounts to is a sash saw. This is a 14 inch sash saw. This one was a little bit over the top. Uh, I had it, again, this is my saw uh, with Coco Bolo and the, the hand engraved uh, spine. Uh, She's since retired, unfortunately. But um, it's a 16 inch or 14 inch, and it's filed strictly ripped. It's for ripping tenons and so forth. Um, that covers about 90%, really. A dovetail carcass and a, and a sash saw will cover about 90% of what you need to do with hand, your, your uh, back saw joinery saws, as they're often called and should be referred to. Um, the nomenclature that you get into with saw is, can be confusing as I'll get out because one person's sash saw, somebody else might call it carcass saw, and they start experimenting and changing lengths of saws, heights of saws. Yeah, but basically, when it comes down to the filing, if you're, you're filing them all for a particular task. Um, people say this is, I'll leave it in the package, but it's a, it's a bigger, well, actually I'll take it out, but it's a bigger plate to boot. Now you notice this one's more of a, uh, a traditional shape and everything, it's fine. This is a slotted spine, it's not a folded uh, back, but uh, that's, those are the only kind I made right now. But it's a square plate, it's pretty, uh, other than the Cuban mahogany handle, it's pretty uh, basic. There's not a whole lot to it. It's just a, and it's a tenon saw, straight on. That's about the biggest tenon saw you're really going to need. Um, but now you can really get into some hard saws. Um, this was probably this is the biggest uh, back saw that I make. And it was a it's a custom saw as well. You can see how big it is. It's 20 inch. It's got a 20 inch long uh, tooth now, uh, and it's roughly about 10 ppi, which means it's. Uh, it's going to be a pretty, no, I shouldn't say rough rip coat because it does cut fairly smoothly. But compared to a, a 15 or 16 or 20 PPI, it's going to be able to take off a lot more wood a lot quicker. And again, it, it's filed strictly rip, only for uh, straight line cuts uh, on tenons most of the time. I'm, now, something that's a little bit different, and this is, this is one of my babies actually. I, this is an unused, never been used original. Uh, miter box saw by Henry Distance, the Miller Hall actually, but you can see how big it is. Now, this is about a 26 inch saw, but oddly enough, it's 11 ppi, which is not a lot, it's quite a few teeth for such a large saw. They were using them for miter boxes, and uh, I've got several of them hanging. I have affinity for miter box saws, but these, these saws cut straight, smooth, and their the plates are thicker than a normal uh, joiner. Yeah, saw. Uh, this was actually got about an old 42 plates. Pardon? Love you. Oh. I will. Love anyway, you. It, it, well, one of the things you learn from uh, having Vinci saws like this is how we file, and uh, we, we tend to lose a lot of that information over time. Uh, but this saw gave me a, a perfect example 
and how they were filed back then. This one was filed uh, with uh, 11 PPI, as I said, but it also had, uh, it was a uh, 15 degrees rake and about 25 degrees clean, which I'm gonna explain here in a little bit, as far as rake and clean and so forth, all kinds of filing installs. But in other words, it, it's made, give you a nice smooth cut and would rival pretty much most of your uh, uh, motorized miner boxes now. It's just, it's a big, it's just a big, big uh, salt. And of course, now, once you get out of joinery salts, uh, you start getting into some uh, hand salts, or in this case, this is a panel salt. It's a 20 inch panel salt. I don't know if you can see that okay. So it's not real big, but it's a nice little salt. It's a number seven um, distance, so it's a nice little salt. Um, but they used these when they, they would put these in their totes when they used to walk around with their, uh, their uh, salt totes, more or less, their carpentry totes from house to house. They traveling woodworkers back then, uh, going to work every day with their own tools. And they go up from side, really, from here. They, they start about 18 inches of a panel saw. And the steel is thinner. And of course, they have more teeth um, per inch and a smoother cut. And this would, one would have been a crosscut saw, basically. That's how I have it filed, the crosscut. You go up and oh, so you reach it over here. And this goes into a 24 inch. Now you're, starting, you're still in the panel saw size. Uh, they don't really consider a full hand saw until I uh, get up to about 26 inch. But these, this is, in fact, this one was stamped 10. So this is probably a 10 PPI and it's probably, a, actually, I think it's ripped if I remember, if I remember correctly. I don't remember how I filed it initially. But once you get finished with those, I'll reach way over here. Now this is a fairly old. This, and this is a 26 inch, it's a full size hand saw and it's a rip. And there's only about uh, five teeth per inch on this, or five PPI. So it's a pretty coarse cut. And one thing like I said, all these saws have in common is that they're filed for a specific purpose. Uh, one's filed for rip, one's filed for cross cut, another one's filed you know, for uh, cut. You've heard of uh, combinations or may have heard of hybrid um, filings. Um, when they talk about hybrid filings, basically that's just a combination filing. It's not really a true rip filing and it's not really a true uh, cross cut filing. It's, it's somewhere in between. There's a lot of um, uh, variances on that. And really, uh, if you start to, once you start filing saws, you need to start learning more about how, how you want something to cut with a particular wood, whether it's walnut, cherry, or some Australian wood, or bobo. How it's filed uh, helps to smooth the cut out and it also helps to. Uh, basically get through the wood. Some of the wood's pretty hard, especially the uh, Australian woods. Now, as far as a rip goes, when you're filing a saw, I'm going to, actually, I don't know if you can see this little picture right behind me. I'm trying to do this. By you'll notice these are straight across. That's basically how a, a rip filing looks like when you're filing it. And uh, the V is probably not quite as big, but I'm sloppy. I'm not a very good artist. But if you're, if you're filing this cross, the and you would really be filing it, your teeth would be more of a, an angle, this. There it goes, cheek lift. And then that would, um, you, you can actually look down the saw plate, you can actually see that V going down the saw plate. And that's because the crosscut teeth are literally slicing the, uh, the, teeth, the wood away as they're cutting through, which gives you a smooth cut of the crosscut. Um, so the rip basically is, people use the phrase a chisel teeth, but it's really not a chisel. A rip saw tooth is really more of a scraping, an aggressive scraper, and scrapes the wood away. And of course, the, the teeth uh, expels the saw dust as it comes out of the cut. So you really want to know kind of what you're cutting when you're, when you're filing your saw. And uh, it, it does help to, uh, like I said, to keep in your own mind anyway, what you want to do with the saw. And a lot of times with me, a lot of people tell me how they want the saw filed. And I just, I basically just file it with whatever they want. Now, as far as the definitions of, uh, I don't know how much you guys know about hand saws and so forth. As far as the definitions of rake, clean, um, pitch. Pitch is simply the teeth per inch. Uh, not a big deal, but, so this one is probably an 11, or 10 T per inch or 11 PPI points per inch. When you're, when you're filing a rip saw, you're filing it so that the teeth, like I said, almost like chisels, more of a scraper really, 
they're going straight across. Everything, if you look down the teeth, you'll see they're all going straight across. If you look, if you know, I saw somebody. Oh, okay. <laughs> Something sending a message. Uh, anyway, if you look at a crosscut saw on the end here, now the teeth are more of an, of an angle. They're all, every other tooth is filed at the same angle. And every other, you know, and of course the other direction as well. And that cre creates your knife effect when you're cutting, you're slicing your, uh, your crosscut saws. So that's basically how that goes. Now there's something called rake. You're looking at, and, and this is one of the key components to um, filing a saw and having a saw actually cut consistently and smoothly. And if you were to, uh, you see, okay, great. If you were to have some teeth, you want to do it this way. Uh, Rick actually do this way. See that? Yeah. This angle, this tooth is leaning back. That's your rig. Oh, I've got a, oh, I've got some, okay, I've got somebody's sensitive there. Can everybody see this okay? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but, but that angle is, is giving you your, your rig. The further that angle is back, the more, the more rake you have and the less aggressive that saw is going to be. So if you have a, a you want to draw a straight line. Yikes. You want to draw a straight line. Where that came from? Nope. Maybe I can do a little better. Draw it here for you. This is where I wish I would have drawn them out ahead of time. But let's say, okay. All right, now this, okay. And then these angles are all, they were all still going to come out to be about 60 degrees or about 120, depends on how you look at them. Which matches your saw lines, and I'll show you those in a second. But if you look at this now, one a rip saw might have only eight degrees of rip, so it only has about eight degrees here from a vertical back about eight degrees. A uh, crosscut saw might very well have fifteen degrees, so you got you know from vertical back come to fifteen degrees. So it's leaning back more and it's going smoother through the wood. It's easier to push it as well because it's not grabbing, like I said, the scrapers. Now think about the rake, and like I said, rake is generally speaking your general ranges. My rake saws are going to have anywhere from zero degrees rake to to ten degrees rake. Uh, ten is going to get pretty relaxed on uh, on a rip saw, uh, but on the other hand, if you're filing something hybrid. And you might want that relaxed, or you might want, you know, a, an eight degree rake with some flame on. Now, the flame, of course, is side to side at that angle, which gives it that nice uh, knife cut. Your your files. Now, I want to show you the differences in files because that's one thing about the saws is that the smaller the teeth, the smaller the files obviously need to be. Uh, so they, now these are this is a four double X on in my left hand here, and then the next one's a six double X. And then you go from a six to the left to a seven X. And obviously there's a lot more files in these. I don't use every size file that is out there. Um, there are charts that you can look up online. And the charts, if you can see this, for example, uh, there we go. I don't know if that, you can read see that all right. Now what I do, I have the recommended size files and then I have these size files that I actually use most of the time. Which in my, in my case, I, I will use a needle file for my dovetail saws, 15 ppi to 20 ppi. I will use a 5 double X uh, file for my, my um, 12 ppi, um, 12 and 13 ppi basically. And when I get into bigger, 10 ppi, 11 ppi, I start with a 6 double X file. And obviously, when you get to about a, a the, uh, the 8 PPI saw, which is bigger teeth yet, I'll go to a 7 double X file. But I usually use the 7, the double X just stands for uh, uh, extra, extra slim. So you've got a 7, 7 X, which is extra, extra slim or slim. Then you've got a double extra slim. It's just a matter of the, the width of the file and the width of the gullet. And the gullet is the bottom of that tooth. That way down here, that's your gullet down here. Um, different files will give you a, a wider gullet. Um, a sharper go. I generally stick with the double X files. These days, um, 
Back then, they used to work on a lot more green woods, so you had to worry about something called slope, which was filing at a, not only were you filing at an angle one way, but you were also filing at an angle up and down, vertically on a salt plate, which makes it even more difficult to file the salt. Uh, but that, what that did was that helped to dispel the wet sawdust that was in, caught in the teeth. Uh, as, as the sawdust gets caught up in the teeth, it just makes the saw bind. And that's particularly true on uh, hand saws, you know, when they were ripping big, big boards that were green and so forth. Um, now, as far as the filing goes, there are certain things you do need to file uh, the saw, obviously. Um, your plate and saw, naturally your saw. And of course, your files, uh, whatever size teeth, depending on what you're filing, you're going to need that the appropriate size uh, file, saw file for. Um, they're all, they're all uh, three, basically known as three square files. I use double cut files. Uh, there is a three cut, I believe, which is even smoother yet. I, I don't know that that's really a necessary uh, thing to do. And I'm, I'm sure there's probably somebody out there that uses, uses something that, that fine. But once you start using it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go all just as quick. Uh, another thing you're going to want to use, you're going to need, is a, a saw set. A saw sets, I don't hear you. You can see that. Now, this is a um, 42X, a Stanley 42X. In fact, I've got it highlighted. I've, I've got several different uh, saw sets. I leave them set up one, once for dovetail because I've modified them. Once for dovetail saw, I've got one for a bigger saw and then uh, you know, it's a sash saw and so forth, and then one for the, the biggest saws, which is just standard uh, 42X. But there's this design, and then there's another design that's based off the Eclipse. If I've got it, yeah, I've got Eclipse right here. Now, this is the, the original Eclipse. You can see, if you look at it, it's got a little bit different. Um, profile to it. It keeps your hands up off the saw plates when you're using a saw plate in a vise. Sometimes the 42X being lower, your hand hits the saw vise and gets to be a little bit cumbersome. Uh, the um, Eclipse on the other hand hits your hand at a much higher angle away from the saw plate, a little easier to use. The part that's inside, you know, which is important to be nice and hard, but that's basically your anvil. And you have a, a plunger inside, which I don't know if you can really see it in there or not, but it comes out and it, it, it uh, that's basically your hammer. There are, of course, now these are plier types, and this is all I use. I don't use a, a hammer set uh, on setting my saws. Now, some people do use hammer sets, and there's, you know, some some discussion on good or bad, or so forth. A hammer set uh, tooth may be a sharper bend in the steel. Um, the uh, plier set may be more of a rounded bin in the steel when you're setting the saw teeth. But either way, they, they both work as long as it's consistent. If your rake is consistent and your filing is consistent and, you're, and your setting is consistent, the saw is going to work just fine. You don't have to um, go to any great extremes on the saw. The, the 42X is probably the most popular plier type that I'm aware of. Another thing you're going to need obviously for filing saws, it, it comes in quite handy, is a file guide. Uh, this hooks on to my file, and this is one from uh, uh, Lee Valley. And basically, I modified it. I put a level on the top. Oop, oh, there you go. Sorry about that, guys. But you can see there's a level up there, and the only reason I do that is when I'm filing a saw plate, I want everything to be nice and consistent, so I keep that level, uh, bubble level, so that I don't change my rate. Because every time I, I move and I shift, I'm changing that rate. And an inconsistent rake is going to make your saw one hop a little bit. It's not going to cut consistently or, or uh, smoothly as it goes. Um, but like I said, it, these are easy. It's just a line level that I mounted on there. And like I said, the saw file. And if you're uh, if you're in the class, I don't know if anybody on here is in that class at the end of the month, um, I'll have a couple of these. Uh, I think there are a couple of guys have already requested them. But they're hard to get it, but supply and demand these days is not real great. But this is a needle file, by the way. So you can see how small it is. And it was for filing my, my dovetail saws that I've been working on lately. All right. And that's really, I mean, the crux of it, 90% of it is practice. Um, the more you, you file a saw, the better you get at it. Um, some people want to make a saw. I've had requests from people to, uh, they want me to sell them parts, for example. and uh, but they want me to file the saw for them. <laughs> they want me to flush the teeth and sharpen the teeth for them. And, and really, that, you know, then all you're doing is you're just piecing it together. Um, it's really important to know how to file a saw. If you're going to use hand saws all the time, especially with saws, 
uh, which is the most popular these days, uh, it's important to know how to file the saw. So there's nothing worse than a dull saw. It's, it's not going to cut right for you. It's going to veer one direction or the other. And it's, it's going it, to, I can't think of a better way to uh, discourage you from using hand tools than to have a, a poorly sharpened saw, a poorly sharpened chisel or other tool. They all have, you know, we look at them as if, you know, we're going to beat them with a the hammer and so forth. And whether it's a saw, a chisel, a plain iron, uh, when it's well tuned, well sharpened, they, they cut like a dream. And uh, even scrapers, if anybody's gone to, uh, to the trouble of looking up how to how to put a hook on a scraper, for example, uh, if it's done properly, they, they just slide right around. You can get a smoother finish with that scraper than you will with sandpaper. And it's pretty impressive what you can do with, with properly sharpened tools and hand tools. So obviously our, our forefathers, craftsmen of the days come by and do much more than we do. Uh, like I said, we've lost a lot of it over the years. And, uh, and, I, and I'm just a, a novice, a hat compared to some of these guys. Uh, you get somebody that worked, used hand saws for 40 years, that's all, all they've ever used, and they could probably do things that uh, I personally could, <laughs> could not do. Um, but I try to, I'm more of a hybrid word worker, I try to mix in everything that, that uh, I can. One of the other things you're gonna need uh, before I forget is a saw vise, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to, a lot of different saw vices out there. Um, you can make, you don't have to go out and buy an expensive saw. What we can do, this is a, for example, this is a homemade one. This is the first one I had when I started uh, filing saws. I don't know if everybody can see that. It's pretty basic. Um, you know, I just, I put the saw that basically goes in between two pieces of wood and it clamps down on the saw plate and it allows me to file the saw. Now, obviously this one I modified a little bit so I can take it wherever I want and I can set it on the workbench and clamp it down and it won't go anywhere or I can put it in, in a vise and do the same thing. Um, like I said, if anybody's wanting to come by and have CDs or take a look at the chart or whatever you want, uh, just stop by, um, you know, the 29th, I guess, is when they saw sharpening classes. Uh, I'll be there most of the day. So and I'll try to have some uh, some extra charts for people to take if they want to take those with them and you can look at some of these, these this homemade saw vise. But it works out quite well. I mean, you could even modify it to make it better than it is. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do with them. A step up from that is going to be this is a Gramercy. Move that saw before I damage it. This is a Gramercy saw vise. Uh, it's, it's about 14 inches long. I wish they had made it about 18, but you know, it's their vise. But now this is now you're getting up into starting to spend a little money when you buy one of these. But if you're planning on sharpening saws, you know, it's gonna, it's worth your while to, to get one. Now this one also I, I've modified. I have um, saw guides. There we go. That I can stick on the front and that gives me my angles. So I'm looking at an angle the whole time that I'm filing so I can follow that angle and keep my fleam pretty consistent with it. Um, like I said, they're just, and they're just a piece of whiteboard with some, uh, some uh, markers. The lines in it, and I, I slap it on there, and I, and I know if I'm filing 25 degrees flame or 20 degrees flame or whatever I'm using. But it comes in handy. But the, the Gramercy is a nice little vice. It's just uh, like I said, you're getting in certain to spend money on vices. And uh, of course, obviously, the granddaddy of them all. That's one I can set it up here, but keep from dropping. It's heavy. Is an Acme vice. Now, this is a pretty good size. I can see this thing. I've actually painted it, but it's uh, about 26 inches long. And it's, uh, this one's a cast aluminum. My, my main one that I use on my bench is actually a cast iron, which is heavier yet. And of course these handles, I can't put it down, but the handle on the front pops down and, and it has a ball bearing in it and uh, clamps down on the metal. And, it, and these are very durable. And uh, there's, they're very, also very expensive. I think the uh, last one I bought was about $700. So it's not something you, you want to spend a lot of money on unless you're going to file a lot of saws. Uh, but there are, they are out there um, here and there. I've had probably five or six of them. And I'm getting down to about two of them now. So, uh, But other than that, um, that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, a lot of it's hands-on learning, tackle, uh, getting used to the files, getting used to the... Uh, Filing the different thicknesses of steel. Uh, dovetail saw might have a, an 015 plate thickness, which is pretty flimsy. 
Um, and obviously, if you run a file across that, you can take a whole lot more tooth away with just one stroke of the file than you can with, say, a plate that's full 32 thick, which would be a, a pretty good size tenon saw, basically a full size tenon saw. Um, a lot of my saws are 025. So I go on uh, my dovetail, Western dovetail is an 020 because I like the rigidity of the steel. Uh, some people use 018. Uh, some they can go down to 015. My uh, gent saws are actually 015, which I said it's the, the thinner the steel, the less height you're going to have in the saw. It loses rigidity as it goes up. So those dovetails are generally 020. My uh, carcass saws and sash saws are usually 025. And then uh, I like the, my 16s and bigger, I like to use the two plates because obviously you're doing a lot heavier tech work with them. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, like I said, different files for different two size, uh, different, uh, you get used to the different feel of them when you're filing so that you're not filing away too much. And you'll get that, uh, you get something called calves and cows when you first start out. And it, uh, basically you've got, one tooth here, and then if you mess up, you got this little short guy down here, and all of a sudden you got this other big guy up here, and maybe you got a little short guy here, and, and of course that's gonna that's gonna give you that, that up and down jerk <laughs> when you're trying because you're cutting with with uh, fifty percent less teeth basically, uh, but it's it's, uh, it's common to to run into that when you first start filing. So, so, uh, so the nice part about me is I have a saw punch, so I. I was going to say, we've Go got ahead. a couple of questions out there, if you don't mind. Oh, well, fire away. Please do. All right. We had uh, one to ask about Japanese saw design. Can you oh, well, Jap that? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, Japanese saw, and it's, a, let's see, do I have, no, I don't have one hanging here. I've got a couple of uh, replacement plates here. Japanese saw is a, it's a thinner plate, generally speaking. It is a plate that is, is it's a saw tooth design that made the cut on a pull stroke. Um, the nice thing about Japanese saws is they don't really kink per se because you're always they're always in tension. When you're pulling them backwards, it keeps that plate in tension, it keeps that plate straight. Whereas a Western style saw tends to push against the plate, so you're pushing. So you want to make sure that that plate is uh, nice and stern. You don't. You've heard, probably heard people talk about uh, retensioning saw plates when, when they have folded backs, and that's because of that pressure against that, that saw plate and the folded back doesn't hold it. Rich. The Japanese saw, on the other hand, and with the type of filing that it has, it's, um, it's more of a feathered type of file. I don't, and I don't personally file Japanese saws because it takes a whole other set of saw files and, and so forth. And, and a lot of them these days are uh, flame hardened teeth, and you just you can't do anything with a flame hardened to saw. It's, even your uh, hand saws that are sold in your, your box stores, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, so forth. A lot of them are, are flame hardened. You'll see a little blue blowing across the teeth and the way they're filed. And you, you can't, those teeth just break off. You can't do anything with them. Um, you, just, you would have to get past that, that blowing to get into it. Even uh, laser cut uh, saws, I have, in fact, I have some plates here that were laser cut for me. And the heat from the laser hardened the outer edge of the uh, saw plate. So I literally have to, in order to use those plates, I literally have to grind away about eight of an inch all the way around the saw plate to use them. I learned that the hard way. After uh, much money, but um, like, the, like I said, the good thing about the Japanese and people love those Japanese saws. If um, if you want to take the time to file them, uh, you buy the right proper files. I'm sorry, I don't have one of the files with me. I've got them in my tool chest. I just don't mess with them because, of, like I said, most of them are flame hardened. Uh, you have to buy a really nice one to get uh, something that you can actually sharpen. But like I said, black guys love those. Uh, like I said, it stays in tension and. Uh, Cuts nice and straight. You know, I guess when you wear out the flame hardened teeth, you go out and buy another plate. But that's really all I can tell you about um, okay. you know, the Japanese saws. It's more of a preference. I'm, I'm, like I said, I use primarily Western type saws, pistol grip, uh, gent saws, and so forth. Okay. All right. And then there's a couple of questions around the steel that you use. What, oh, okay. What, what kind of steel do you use? How do you decide what kind of steel to use? And well, most steel saw, is oh. the best type to keep the saw sharp. Okay, well, most saws are, uh, you look at 1095 is really what was originally uh, used, a 1095 spring steel. 
Uh, there's a lot of variances to that. And, you know, of course, manufacturers in the marketing of hype, of course, will try to make one sound much better than the next one. You know, this is silver steel. This is, you know, double temp or whatever. Um, but it's, it, most of us, 1095. Now, these days, you have, you know, 1075 spring steel, 1095 spring steel. You have that. And uh, some of the um, uh, box stores, I, I have no doubt, don't use 1095 spring steel. Um, you want an RC of uh, any, well, my, my, the RC rating on my spring steel, for example, is 4851. It, it's hard to find uh, a rock roll of uh, 52 these days, but that's what they were always went for uh, back when they were making their saws. And in fact, the, um, the, the distance saws and the saws of you know, 200 or so years ago, a lot of these guys made their own steel when they, when they first started out. Now, Henry Distance is one that really just uh, really modernized the uh, saw making field per se, as far as factories. And of course, Sheffield tool works over in England. They were both going on at the same time. But uh, Henry went, went to, uh, he, he just knew a lot about steel. He knew how to grind them and how to, and, and some of that was proprietary. You know, I don't think the old boy ever gave up any of that. To this day, people are still trying to figure out some of this process. But um, 1095 is pretty much the standard with an RC of 40 to 51. Uh, if you can find an RC of 52, some people will tell you it's an RC of 52. Uh, I did have one, uh, Manufacturer offered to make me uh, some, cut some saw plates for me, and he couldn't get the 1095 that I wanted. I could get it, but he couldn't get it in the big sheet that he wanted. So he offered to make me the 1075. Well, that's the and what it comes down to is the amount of uh, iron in the saw plates. So it's it's like putting nickel in something that makes it so much harder to seal uh, stainless steel. As you put nickel in them, they get a lot harder, they get a lot, a lot uh, more resistant to rust. 1095 obviously has more iron in it. It will, it's got a, it's kind of in that, that magic zone where it's got the toughness that it needs, but at the same time, you can still file it, the file. You don't want anything much more than 52 RC. Um, old one on steel, for example, is easy to sharp, which is something different. Different is uh, you know, more difficult to get that nice keen edge, but it holds it off. And like I said, so it's a it's a spring steel. Okay, I, I don't have any other questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, if someone wants to key one in or unmute yourself and ask Ron directly. Ron, this is Bill Shukat. How many saws? Have yeah, you I just like can. So. How many saws have you made in your life? Oh boy, <laughs> I could count them. Um, two or three hundred? I, you know, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I, I'd have to go back all my list that I've had over the last seven eight years and, and count count them. Um, like I said, I get on a roll sometimes. One year I made about a hundred of them. Another year I only made you know forty five. Another you know, it just depends. I've actually slowed down these last few years, I don't know, old age or yeah, <laughs> what. Yeah, but we but, all. Uh, you're getting in too much. I'm getting ready to retire. So my guess is I will probably go up in I make. But they, yeah, they, um, the, the thing about my saws, is they're, they're not production of saws. I don't buy the saw plate pre-punched and pre-filed and sharpened and all that. And I don't buy, you know, handles that somebody else see and see for me. I do it all myself by hand. Uh, pretty much. I mean, I do use bandsaw, obviously, and that sort of thing. Uh, but everything, when it comes to shaping the saw plate, uh, the saw, I, I do it with a rash, just like everybody else. You know, uh, I've got probably, gosh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 different types of brass I use. And so I do all that shaping by hand. And it just There's just some things you can do by hand that CNC still can't do yet, uh, at least not on a uh, production basis. Um, like I said, it just really kind of depends on what you're uh, what you're looking for. If you're just looking for a utilitarian saw, um, you know, that, that cuts well, you know, and nothing, no thrills, no thrills. There's there's several people out there to make those. I don't know how much of it actually is uh, hand done. I mean, some people are going to tell you I hand filed the saw when they really did just kind of touch the saw and touch it up. Um, 
but you know, other, other people tell where this is a handmade saw, but then they've got CNCs and everything doing all the work for them. So I guess it's your definition. It just takes me longer to make a saw than, uh, than a lot of guys do with machines. Uh, probably eight hours per saw, maybe. So, so what is your total hours on, on the saw? You just said eight hours, but that's not for the whole thing, right? Are we on? We lose him. I think we might. David? Oh. It's like he's muted. Okay. Yeah. Are we... Ron, your audio is not great, but you are unmuted and should be able to talk again. It is Ron, right? That's not, I mean, it's not me. Yeah, uh, he's muted again. Yeah, I'm really getting broken. I'm wondering if my connection is. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Connection is secured. Hmm. Ron, I think you're back with us now. Okay, am I back yet? Yes. Hear you. I don't. I seem to have. Um... Hmm. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Well, on that note, should we? Anybody else have questions for Ron? Dave, uh, uh, Bill, can you sp speak to the class that's coming up? On, is this class on sharpening? Yeah, it's a class on sharpening. I, I didn't look up the date, but I think it's the 29th. Um, the last time I looked, there were only four people that had signed up. So if anybody wants to sign up, uh, go ahead and do so. If the class gets full and you still want to, sh to sign up, uh, send me an email and I'll adjust the maximum size of the class. Okay. I see Ron is back, but he is now on my back. We see you, but your audio is a little flaky. Are we there? Try again, please. Ron? Wow. Well, if no one objects, should we bring this to a close then? Bill, you okay with that? Or you want to try Ron? I have a question for Ron. Okay. Ron, uh, currently the class has six members and we've set the maximum at six. Would okay. you feel comfortable with more students than six in the class? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. I, I, I didn't know if it was my Wi-Fi cutting in and out or what it was. Uh, no, I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, the, only, the only question would be, uh, 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 items that they would need, such as the, uh, the uh, saw vices, mostly. Uh, saw sets, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. If they want to file in, guys, I only have three. And I can bring, I think I'll have a total of four that I could bring. Uh, so that kind of thing is, uh, 
it would be the concern. But as far as class size, I, that's that's fine. I don't mind. Um, what, you know, whatever we can get to work, because I, I don't have a problem. With, I'm vaccinated. I don't. <laughs> I'm all good to go. But um, yeah, whatever you know, if they can get everything you need, that'd be great. So, and I don't know how many you know spaces you have there as far as uh, workbench space. But I have. Uh, I actually have punched out already six. Uh, saw plates in O25 steel at, at 11 ppi, and I did that because they didn't. Know, they could uh, once they filed this and learned how to file, and uh, if they get it nice enough that they, they want to make a saw out of it at some point down the road, they'll be able to make a saw out of it. Um, focus on uh, rip filing first because that's the easiest to learn, and then um, show them you know some of the things that they can make down the road as far as uh, saw guys to use. Um, if I can pull the camera off, I'll show you what I what I use. And I just, it'll have, take me a second to stabilize it. So I'm gonna pull this off, hopefully. And, uh, and I'm gonna try and, okay. Now, can you see that at all? Mm -hmm. so, are we uh, looking at the wooden or the metal? It's an Acme saw vise. I'm gonna try and hold it still. So we see you a grid see that white background behind it. And that is uh, actually. Oh. David, anything we can be doing? I'm afraid not. Uh, for everybody's benefit, I went ahead and changed the flash limit to a, a maximum of 10. So there are four more spaces available for the class if you're interested, uh, even if he's limited on the number of saw devices that he has and tools. Uh, I expect you, uh, the class can work around that. So. And what was that date? Were uh, we able to it is the 29th. 29th. Ron, Who's that guy in the shades? Yeah. Ron, we're not doing real well on your audio and video. You are muted, Ron. There we go. I'm back again. I keep okay. going off and on. I, I'm wondering if it's my Wi-Fi out here. Uh, I'm in a rural area. And for whatever reason, this time of night, uh, <laughs> I have fits with my... Uh, and it's supposed to be fiber too. Figure that one out. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm paying all this money for fiber. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe they're throttling me. I don't know because uh, I refuse to buy the TV part of it. <laughs> so, but no, I, I don't have a problem. However many people want to put in there, as long as everybody's comfortable with it. Um, like I say, obviously, the more people, it's just going to be. It'll be a little more difficult for me to get around. So I like to walk around and, and look what everybody's doing, and make sure that. Um, you know, doing it right because it's tactile and it just takes practice and, and time. So whatever we can uh, do to, to help people out, if you're going to use hand saw, you really need to know how to sharpen them. And uh, besides that, if you don't, you're going to be sending it off to get it sharpened all the time. That's good for my pocket, but I don't know about yours. <laughs> so these saw sharpening is not cheap. Um, they start out about thirty-five dollars and go up, depending on the saw. So and it's a time-consuming thing for me, especially if they're poorly sharpened before I get them. Um, you know, then I have to go through the whole process of uh, reshaping all of the teeth and, and the bigger the saw, the more time it takes. And sometimes I've been known just to repunch new teeth on. Let's <laughs> see, give up on that. And that gets uh, the, the uh, older saws can be a problem too. The steel, unfortunately, degrades like everything else with age and it can get more brittle. Um, so some of the older minty saws can, can actually break the teeth a lot easier. Um, than the newer saws. So, and hopefully, I answered everybody's question on the 1095 steel. It's pretty much a standard on the, the saws, although there are people that are using different steels. A different um, Lee Valley, I'm pretty sure, is using a different type of steel. Uh, it still comes out basically the same. Uh, he makes for dollar for dollar, uh, Rob uh, actually has some pretty nice saws when it comes right down to it. You know, Lee Valley saws compared to some of the other more custom stalls. 
Um, so I got a lot of respect for Rob. But, uh, he's a pretty, pretty straightforward guy. But, so we had one person ask, how do you charge for sharpening? Well, like I said, that, that, that varies from salt to salt. Like I said, it starts out about $35, which is, you know, a dovetail saw. Uh, if I'm going to have to do a, some major re reworking of the saw tooth, it might be $50. And that's why I say it's really, you know, it's nice if you can file your own saw and you're, you're much better off and you're going to save money down the long run. Um, the old the old carpenters of days gone by, you know, they would carry a little saw files and, that, and, and the carpenter would tell us and they'd get down with it at the end of the day and they would touch up the teeth on their saws, um, you know, because that was what they depended their life, their lifeline on was. Uh, but it, it's just a good, and you'll understand better how the saw works if you, if you know how to file them. So, I never recommend anybody buying a custom saw right off the bat because it's just a lot of money to put into a saw. And if you're not familiar with sharpening it, I mean, you can mess it up pretty easy. And uh, plus, you really don't know what you want until you've used them for a while. You know, like I said, I have so many variances, even my dovetail saws, I've got three different hang angles, not counting the, the jet saw. So it depends on how, you, how you're holding the saw as well. Um, so anyway, yeah, it, it helps to answer the question. But it starts out at 35 and it can go up from there. I, I did have a guy file uh, three of my saws at one point in time. I think it cost me uh, $200 by the time I got it back. So kind of tells you, yeah, he, he got me. <laughs> no, he did a nice job. So, you know, but there was just three saws. And I said, he did a nice job. And I said, well, that's great. But my, my wallet didn't like it very much. So, and 1095 does hold up quite a bit, as long as you're not cutting into concrete and <laughs> that sort of thing. So, most wood these days is kiln dry. So it's a little better. But yeah, it must, like I said, uh, just let me know how many uh, people are going to be at the class. That way I can have saw plates for everybody. And I'll try to keep everybody basically the same saw plate and same tooth count. That way it's easier for me to go from person to person to see how they're doing it. And, uh, and of course, I'll have the files for that there. So I'll save you some couple bucks there too, because I'll have files for those same plates, the, the proper size file. Um, I can't guarantee saw handle or file handles for all of them. Uh, if you have a block, a stick a block with a hole in it, works great for a handle. <laughs> but you know, I can't have the file. But if you want a file guide, that's another story. Like I said, I've got two people that I had three of them, and I know two of them are, are spoken for already. And then also the uh, the visors, the magnifying visors. Uh, if you don't have them, I know Lee Valley used to sell them and Lee Nielsen sold them. Um, let me see here. Here, they're called Magnifocuser. Now there are other other things, and I, and I forget the best in the server, but at one point in time, I had a whole bunch of these and I, I basically sold them all. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's called a Magnifocuser. And uh, if I turn around the back, it's got, uh, you can buy various lenses for it. So the more, the stronger the lens, obviously the smaller the teeth. Uh, I, I use three different lenses. I've got a 2X, a 3X, and a 4X. So depending on what size teeth I'm filing at the time. Now, some people actually like to use those, uh, you know, those overhead lights that had the magnifier in them. I don't know what those things are called, but I, I have one on my drafting cable. Actually. Some people like to use those. The only downside to those is as you're filing, you know, you, you can shake it. If you're shaking the table, that light shakes too. <laughs> it becomes a little more, a little more difficult to watch and see what you're doing. So I said, oh, I've got, there's another, there's all kinds of magnifiers out there. But whatever works for you, that you can actually see the teeth better. Um, everything else I should have, you know, the, the dicum die, I will have plenty of that there to uh, put dye on the teeth that just as you're firing that dye away you can see the teeth easier as well. So um, if anybody's got a, a big saw they want to practice on, great, just let me know what it is so I can bring the proper size file for it. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, however many you want there, it's great. So I wish I could go in, you know, better show and tell and stuff, but it's kind of hard to do with, on the Zoom part, but the, the class should, um, I'll bring a couple of my saws as well. Um, which class should be show a little more as an example of what you need to do. So it's a little easier. Like I said, it's a tactile thing, it's touchy feely kind of thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Ron, I'll send, I'll send you an email a couple of days before class. Okay. Yeah. People that have signed up and accounts right. so that yeah, you'll know what to expect. I, 
I think that he's in the middle of my four day from the firehouse. So hopefully, uh, yeah, I don't have to go as long as I had time to make the plates and so forth. And then, uh, how much ahead do you want me to? Send? Oh, a, a day would be great. You know, that way I'll know that night I can come out and shop and uh, punch some plates. Because this time of year, I'm not doing a whole lot of saws. I'm outside, you know, fixing up my tar paper shack and that sort of thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I avoid my shop this time of year. But um, it's uh, just let me know what, what we have and how many people we have. So, so, so. Okay. someday I may become a great oracle, but I doubt it. <laughs> so. Well, well right. thank you, Ron. I mean, this has well, been a, a great and informative program. I hope everyone well, got a few nuggets out of it. And uh, it's, I'm glad that we're going to be able to open up the class for a few more students, for those that might be interested after uh, tonight's program. So yeah. thank you for, for being our speaker tonight. Well, that's OK. I'm, uh, hopefully, I didn't uh, confuse everybody too much. Like I said, I'm not the best speaker in the world. So I, uh, I tend to wing it and uh, take it as I go. And <laughs> it's just sometimes it's easier just to answer questions. But you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I yeah. hope to see everyone next month, You know, our first live in-person meeting. And our program will be uh, on bandsaws. So Dan Coleman is going to share everything we need to know about bandsaws. And I, as I said, cake, ice cream, and now I'm committing to pies as well. So <laughs> as, as before, uh, we are meeting at the Mula Shrine Center on Fifi Road. And more of the exact time and address and all that will be on our website and in the email coming out. Okay, so, so it's, just, it's the same place that it has been since... Yes. Uh, you know, yes. before the pandemic then? Yes. Okay. okay. Same place, same yeah. room, same time, whatever that was. I don't even remember yeah. after so just, many yeah. months ago. I so but rarely as I get said, it. our social hour before the meeting will be our uh, dessert time. And I know we'll see it, lots of folks there. So with that, Bill, anything else you want to say to wrap up today's program? Oh, I just thought Ron did a great job in spite of what he thought. <laughs> I don't know about that, buddy. I'm, like I said, I'm not the most, um, I've got a little bit of ADD and a little bit of OCD to go along with it. So, you know, they balance each other out. <laughs> so. And they do. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll close this out and see you next month. Thank all right. You, maybe again, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ron. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you all very much. You're welcome. Not a big deal. Thank you. So hopefully next month I can ask more questions.